Hello, I'm Lux, and technology is awesome. And I'm Ember, Wakanda forever. And we're talking about Marvel's The Black Panther. So yeah, we just saw this in theaters. So whenever this comes out, we're dating it. It's okay. It's probably out on one of your streaming services or DVD or Blu-ray by now. So go ahead, pick it up and watch if you haven't seen it yet, because it's awesome. And we're going to tell you how awesome in this recording. So please, if you haven't seen it, go see it first and then come back. We'll wait for you. You know, because you had that wonderful thing called a... You paused me, didn't you? Right in the middle of me saying something. I was going to say the word pause. Don't do that. You did it again, didn't you? <sighs> it's okay. I don't mind being... I was... I just said I wasn't... They keep pausing me, Ember. <laughs> well, that is part of having a streaming thing that's not live. It can be paused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they never pause you. It's always me. Oh, they, they, they just skipped me. <laughs> at least they're looking at the picture. That's good. Just let you know ahead of time. Or future. Whatever. I have no idea what I drew. So whatever I'm drawing, enjoy. Problem is right now he has too many ideas. Because there are way too many kicktail characters. Yeah, characters. Tech. The Black Panther suit, which there are three versions of in this movie. The original that was in Black Panther's Black Panther Civil War. Yeah, that works really well. Captain America Civil War, the one he wore in that. And then we had another one for the evil Black Panther. And then we had the new one for him. Dang. And then we have his sister. Also, just to let you know, we're probably not going to say a lot of names. Because one, we're probably, we will probably butcher them. Butcher them? Just like I just said the word butcher. And two... I can't remember them. And so it's going to be faster for me to keep the conversation going if I describe the person instead of saying the name and then have to spend three minutes describing who I mean. And now on to our actual thoughts about the movie. I love how the first thing Ember says right after we get out of the theater is, They did the Panthers wrong. In a movie called Black Panther, they did the Panthers wrong. That's an exact quote, ladies and gentlemen. It is. It, it is. I, I, I said it to Lux first. Mainly for effect because the movie was awesome, but for me that was the first jarring note because everything in the introduction, you know, was all CG and everything. And that was really cool going over the history, Wakanda, the vibranium, the five tribes, the battles, the goddess Bass coming in and creating the first Black Panther. And I didn't pick on the goddess's incarnation because it fit with the style that was being used for the narrative. So that blended with the existing style. My panther nitpick is the panthers that were in the tree when the new king does the trip to the ancestral plane. Yeah, because of the flower's nectar, I believe. The flower's nectar plus the ritual. It was just so richly done, and the style they used, and it's... The, the technique they used is it's hard for me to explain and it, it reminds me a lot of these you know how you used to get like magnets and a lot of flakes on top and you could move it or the iron flakes around with the magnet mm, i know what you're saying but that's not really it's a little bit like that but with the way it moves and switches from form to form so quickly and easily there's actually a sand painting technique and I believe one of the artists was on one of the talent type shows. My father sent me a link to it a few years ago. If we find it we'll put it in the description but she does sand painting on a flat surface and just with her hands changes with a single set of sand tells an entire story, keeps changing and altering the picture that the sand makes. I believe I remember what you're talking about. I think she was also on America's Got Talent. Well, I know she was on some sort of talent show. I was just sent a clip of her specifically. I think she was on a couple of different things. Yeah, once you bring that up, I, it does feel a lot like that. Because it felt very organic and it had transitions. I think the best way to describe it is it's a lot of little grains forming shapes and transitioning between shapes. And 
I love that, especially since they used it in the beginning of the credits, too. Just before the first of the two after credits. Two after credits. Very tricky. Because most people would have stopped after that first one. And I just remembered as, I'm like, I think we should stay a little bit longer. I'm not quite sure if there's another after credits, but there usually is. And I'm trying to shush him because I always stay for the full credits because a lot of people do a lot of hard work to make a movie happen. Not all of them even get credited. Because that's just how huge a movie production crew can be. I was surprised at how short and how slow the credits were in this movie. Because usually on one of these movies, the credits just are in small type and they're going by at like breakneck speeds because there's so many people that work on these things. But I was surprised at the font size and how slow it seemed to crawl. I was like, we're going to be here all night because these credits are usually really long. <laughs> I appreciated the font size because these were highly legible. Most of the time, once you get past the main actors, the main directors, the main costume designer, the main special effects artists, and all of the songs, it speeds up like three times and the font drops like eight points. But we should get back to the movie. And then after we're done talking about the movie, we can talk about the awesome theater. Which is why we're admitting we were in a theater. Stuff that we aren't going to post right away. Rule of thumb is kind of make it timeless. Yeah, and we don't follow all the rules. Rules? Mm. We don't need rules. Uh, Where we're going, we don't need rules. Uh, also, did you catch that Back to the Future reference? There was a Back to the Future reference in this movie. I'm trying to think back now. The sister says it when she's talking to her brother about the new armor. Actually, just before the new armor. I can't remember exactly how it's phrased, but she goes, one of my friends uh, keeps talking about this old movie, and she says something that partic that's particularly points back to the Back to the Future franchise. Nope, totally glossed over it. I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it was like, oh, Back to the Future reference! I get that! Also, the way I did that, for anyone paying attention, I just referenced the first Avengers movie. And speaking of those... This is like the first of the Marvel Universe movies you've seen, right? Yes. So for me, I watched Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Captain America, the first Avengers, the second Avengers. Most of them. I haven't. I'm just going to go over the ones I haven't seen, <laughs> which is the new Thor movie. And I believe one other before that. So I'm only behind on two of them. I was a little concerned about that because one of the big things with the Marvel Universe is that it's all interconnected. In this iteration, everything ties back. So Lux had to fill me in on some stuff in the after after credits. But it does work as a standalone movie. I had no issues following it. And just to clarify, this is really my first exposure to the Black Panther character. I don't really remember him from the Saturday morning cartoon lineup, even though I know we got a lot of the Captain America, Avengers, etc. at least in crossover episodes of Spider-Man. I don't remember. I think the Black Panther may have actually been in that animated version on Fox Kids of Spider-Man at one point, but this is the first time I really got exposed to the lore of this series and the character as a whole because I don't remember the Black Panther at all. No, and I went into this movie mostly blind. I hadn't seen any trailers. I'd heard some chatter because I was stuck somewhere and a television was on. So all I knew was that apparently the movie was awesome and had a lot of kicktail women in it. Yeah, and boy were they kicktail. All of them are well acted and well written because they were written like people. Individual personalities, understandable motivations, and just subtlety in acting and the interacting and the interplay. My favorite out of all of them was the general. She was so well done. Her conflict, her resolution, all of that. I really enjoyed the little sister too. Because <laughs> that is how siblings in healthy relationships tend to interact. She wasn't the annoying little sister because we needed, oh yeah, the Black Panther has a sister. Like, no, she was her own person 
She and her brother had a relationship. She had her own work. She had a little bit of that sidekick moment when the whole driving the car thing came up, but that was handled well, too. That was just an awesome scene. That is like the best driverless car. Yeah! They basically turned the car into a drone! Oh my god! Also, I love how they flipped the script. They had a token white guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, usually it's the other way around. Let's flip the script. How about I eat your brains? Yay? Nay? I'm getting a little bit of yay faces here. <laughs> and yes, we're referencing Gravity Falls in a Marvel movie discussion. Doesn't this movie make you want Marvel and Disney to buy the rights to Thundercats? I didn't know that until you said it, but yes, I want that. Yeah, because they would handle it so well. Oh my god. <laughs> but back to this, and it's so well done. The girls are so well written that it's almost to the point where you're like, Black Panther? That's the guy off to the side, right? This isn't really a movie about the Black Panthers. This is a movie about the kicktail women of Wakanda. But he was well done too. He was very well done. And he had conflict and resolution and goals and so much going on. But he's almost the token male. I mean, there were other men. The, the male to female ratio was much more even. But the women come across so powerful in this movie the the fact that the black panther is king is almost negligible because a king is supported by his people which is reiterated a lot in this movie you can't do this alone to be a good king you need your people so on and so forth and what about the bad guy talk about your good motives yeah exiled from this amazing land that you've never seen find your father murdered with panther claw marks and the story that we were told in the beginning, the story of home, was the story as it was told to the villain in his childhood. So yeah, serious motive, revenge for his father's death and to take the technology of Wakanda and liberate the rest of the world by any means necessary. Though if you pay attention closely, what he meant by the rest of the world was the rest of their people which he considered anyone of his skin color. So in a way, he was exactly like the people he wanted to get revenge against. And he was also wanting to get revenge against Wakanda. Because it's even pointed out by the true Black Panther King that what you're doing, what you're becoming, is exactly what you're trying to fight against. And that doesn't deter Killmonger because he says, I know that. I learned from my enemies, and I will do whatever it takes. Which is how good villains are created, because the villains have motives that to them, they are doing the right thing. Usually a good villain takes what would be considered a good motive and corrupts it just enough that you're like, oh, that's a really good idea, but you're doing it wrong. Because, okay, there are people who are oppressed and starving and hurting, okay? I think most people would probably agree that others should not be oppressed, starving, or hurting. So, humanitarian aid, not so much the violence and the uprising and the blatant killing. It's kind of like that adage again I've used in a previous recording. By him giving them guns is giving a man a fish. It's not solving the problem. The problem is the man will starve to death if you only give him a fish. But if you give him a rod and teach him how to use it and teach him how to properly fish his environment and use his environment without hurting it, then you've solved the problem permanently. So handing these people weapons that are very difficult to stop and can get past metal detectors means that more people are going to die. Teaching them technology and skills and helping them allows them to be able to improve their own lives. And in the process, improve someone else's because they now have the resources to help someone else. It's all very complicated stuff and me and Ember are just two little people sitting in America. <laughs> so we have a very shallow view of this internet. We know it's a lot more complicated than this. We're just talking about a movie. Yep. 
which is really good. And the special effects, the only special effects that were kind of faulty to me were the, um, everything else looks beautiful and blends in nicely. And then we get the rhinos, and I'm like, the rhinos look good and everything, but they feel a little faker than most of the other CG. I'm thinking that's because they were more organic than most of the other CG in the movie. Organic as in portraying a living creature compared to a technology. And our minds are very perceptive to what does and does not look right in an organic form. That's why early CG would throw us off so much. And you look at the first Toy Story compared to the third. By the third movie, the humans almost feel real. And that's also because Pixar did something really neat. They knew how much to push towards the Uncanny Valley, but then you style to circumvent it. So you don't get that, oh my god, this face is so realistic, but oh my god, there's something off about it. Ooh. They still gave a little bit of style and cartooniness to it. So your brain goes, oh, it's just a cartoon. So it's able to ignore the whole, this is realistic, but it looks so good. Does the motion of the rhinos and the weight and the heft and the way they move looked much more realistic than the panthers, but the panthers were on the ancestral plane. So not really real panthers because ancestral plane and more of a astral projection than a real creature, which the rhinos were supposed to represent. The pacing in this movie was just rock solid. I really like the build up to the final battle. Whew, I was, if it wasn't for the fact that the seat reclined, I would be on the edge of it. <laughs> no, the pacing was really good. I bet if we put this movie on that action parabola, it probably hit a lot of sweet spots. That's the reason it's like the golden rule for your pacing. Find this chart, match it. And we're not just talking about matching it for your entire movie. You break it down per scene, per action. If everything follows that curve, mostly, you will have a very satisfying movie. Even if your plot blows, the movie will still feel good to people when they watch it. That's the funny thing about this curve. Is that you can have a bad movie and people will still enjoy it if you hit the curve. This is a really good combination because this was a solid script with good acting. And it hit the curve. Oh, just the acting from everyone in this movie. The Black Panther himself, the bad guy, the women, the token white guy. Now, now, technically we had two because we had the CIA agent and we had Claw. Oh, yeah, Claw. He was fun. He was. I loved him. He's one of those villains you're like, I know he's going to die, but I'm going to enjoy every minute that he's around. He was so Joker-like. If you want to compare him to anything, specifically Keith Ledger's Joker, because he's just so out there and so outside of what other people are expecting. And he seems really smart underneath all the craziness. He brought a whole entourage, not because he was dealing with the CIA, but because he expected Wakanda to be there. And I love the fact that he actually has a music album. Can you get him the SoundCloud link? Get him the SoundCloud like, no, please, just, I, I don't want to hear it. I'm just saying you brought a lot of people. And even though I called him the token white guy a couple of times, he was a good character, too. The CIA agent. And we're pointing out mostly because it's a script flip. Normally, you don't see this ratio in blockbuster-style films. Not the best example because this film actually tanked at the time, but Roger and Hammerstein's Flower Drum song was almost an entirely Asian cast. Actually, I think it was an entirely Asian cast. It should have done so much better. It's a really good movie. I know, it had to have been theatrical release timing. Also, maybe feelings were still running a bit high uh, regarding Asian populations at the time of the release. Hmm. Well, it's a good time now. Track it down and watch it. It's a good movie. If you've read the book, it deviates a lot from the book. And... Normally, I have a field day with that all on its own. But remember, it's a musical. We like musicals here. I will not hurt your ears with my singing. I did that for the DuckTales one, and no. <laughs> a hundred million miracles are happening every day. And Lux not singing would be one of them. <sighs> she skewers me so well, and I keep taking it because it's funny. <laughs> 
Claw was amazing when Killmonger first came in, the way he came in, the way they set up that heist. Brilliant. The camera work and the cinematography throughout this movie is really well done, especially in that one scene you were just mentioning. It was so well cut together. It was so smooth. Even when scenes were cutting from angle to angle, it didn't feel like it was cutting from angle to angle. It felt like the camera actually moved from spot to spot. And there were several times where they did these like continuous panning shots and you're like, how did they do that? Because it was just so well done. Also, the music. Wow. Accented the scene so well and such a variety because you had, you know, the very urban stuff in the real world. And then you have Wakanda being so technologically advanced, but a lot of their stuff was still very drum based, very rhythm based. Not that that's not something that still doesn't occur in music a lot, otherwise we wouldn't have drummers. It had a very different feel. It felt very African, very Savannah, very, you know, stuff they usually use to give you that essence. And it's just, ugh. I especially love how the sister was like listening to a techno version of it. Because it always got very kind of techno vibe, but it was still that drum beat, that chanting that I'm like, wow, I might have to buy the soundtrack to this now. I know, because it's just such a huge variety. Though I'm curious if it's actually Claw singing on the soundtrack, because in the credits, they do include the song that he's singing when he's chained up in the interrogation room. You Do you really want to hurt me? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which was great. Which was hilarious, because if you look at the way he was moving, it was straight up the SNL skit that always used that song with two guys in a bar who were idiots. Huh. I didn't watch much SNL. Yes, I didn't it. either. I just, I know things. I didn't watch really a lot of, the TV was on a lot in my house, but I didn't actually watch a lot of it because I was on my computer drawing stuff, playing video games, you know, creative things. Of course, then YouTube came along and there went that. Let's see. Uh, oh, what did you think of the designs of the buildings? In Wakanda. Did you catch that some of them had like fake thatched roofs that were like techno thatched roofs? A lot of stuff is illusion. And you just have this mix because so much on the surface looks very organic. But then you get to the substations and the transit route and everything else. It's amazing. And they had a lot of maglev trolleys and they had these little tracks that would go along that were like little magnets going back and forth and i love how like tightly packed it was but it was spacious at the same time it was crazy also just the way that everything was incorporated we see the rhinos early on and if you don't know the black panther lore assuming he is part of the black panther lore you don't know their purpose you just know oh hey he's raising a rhino okay protecting species and helping them thrive okay and then the lead war dog blows the horn, and all these armored rhinos come charging in. And did you catch that the Black Panther knew what was going to happen? He was telling him no? The Black Panther saw him raise it, and he's like, no, no, don't do that. They actually tripped me up for a moment, because I actually thought that the other guy wasn't going to show up. The other tribe. Ah, uh, that the Jakari weren't going to come? Yeah, because it would have been such a nice twist, because they break a lot of tropes using that guy. Especially in that one scene at the end where everyone's like, oh yeah, we're doing this together. Me too. Here's my axe. Here's my bow. Uh, <laughs> and then the guy goes, come on guys, are you through? Are you done? Yeah, you know, you're kind of cluttering up my hall here. Your business is over, right? Just interrupts them right in the flow. I was like, yes. <laughs> I like it when they break tropes like that. And I think it would have been okay for them not to come. But I think that it was a test for the Black Panther. Okay, you have refuge, but you don't have an army. Will you still try to do this? Because the leader says that they're even, a life for a life. The Black Panther spared him in the combat. He kept pushing him to yield. You know, your people need you. We don't need to do this. Your tribe needs you. Just 
I wish I knew more about African culture. It looks like there's so much in this movie if I knew more. There probably is, and it, I think it must be done well because I'm not hearing the hue and cry that would be done if it was poorly handled. I know I'm seeing a lot of different cultures of African tribes represented in this movie. I just don't know which ones they are, what their history or anything. I want to learn more. I'm probably going to be doing some wiki diving at some point. And that's another amazing thing about this movie. It makes you want to learn more and go, oh, that's interesting. Like, oh, well, they did a great job of incorporating that. They must have had a good research staff. If it's something you're already familiar with. I just didn't realize that Bast was also an African goddess, and I didn't realize that Hamon wasn't just a um, Hindu god. Hmm. Well, a lot of cultures actually share a lot of god and goddesses. They just don't realize it until you start comparing them. No, but it was interesting because the four tribes that have come together came together under the Black Panther, and the tribe who is separate swears by a different god. Hmm. Because they swore by Hamon, who is the monkey king. Oh, yeah, that would explain even the phrase like, your god, at one point, that the other guy says to the Black Panther. Because they swear by different gods. The tribes are separate. And you see that in how it's designed. So the four tribes have everything panther-themed. And when we go up into the mountains, everything is gorilla-themed. Because even when they are petitioning the leader at one point they call him gorilla so they gave to him the name of the animal just as the king of the four tribes is given the name of the panther hmm so how much more of this movie do we want to talk about because <laughs> we could go on for a while we could but there's one thing i really have to touch on and it requires us uh going back to children's television again hmm. the three scenes Mainly the two for the rightful king, but I'm going to reference all three scenes. The symbolic burials and going to the ancestral plane. Did that remind you of Lion in Steven Universe? Hmm, kind of. I'm going to think about that a little bit more because my brain's doing some like, I got no information, I'm going to do some calculations back here, give me a moment. It's going to take me a while to actually come back later. Because it's a portal and... The deep breaths that the kings have to take when they come out of it. They're told to breathe. And they're buried alive. So they're not breathing. Stephen's not able to breathe when he goes through Lion's Mane. He has to hold his breath. He can't breathe. And it's a transitional. If you look at the planes, it looks a little bit like what you see in the ancestral plane. Because you have kind of the savanna grasses and the trees. Oh, I get what you're going at. Maybe they're influenced by the same thing. Hmm. Did not make that connection. Thank you. Wow, because that was like the first place my brain went, and then I got distracted with, you call those panthers. Ah, <laughs> uh, Imba, you are awesome. I'm sorry, I have a miniature one right here. No, we do not actually own a illegal exotic pet. Calm down. It is a very black kitty who's enjoying her favorite perch right now. She's on top of the treasure chest like a good guard cat. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is why we can't play video games anymore. That was awesome. So should we talk about the theater now and then wrap things up? Because part of the reason we wanted to admit that we saw this in theaters and totally gum up any chance of this um, being a filler that we could just slip in when we needed to add something for content is because this was also our first trip to this theater, which is new to our area. Apparently the theaters I've been in before are cruddy compared to this one, because I'm usually okay with chairs, but after sitting in this chair, I'm going to find like any other theater seat uncomfortable. I always find the theater seats uncomfortable because my feet don't touch the ground and the next row is too far away for me to put my feet up on the back of the next person's seat, which I could only do if that seat was empty because, oh my god, how rude is that, especially if my foot slips and jars the other person. These had tray tables with cup holders and buttons to raise and lower the seat and to recline. There was room to recline. And still let people walk by because people walked past 
Well, we had these like fully extended and Lux's legs are longer than mine. So his, I'm not sure which of us was reclined further back. I think we were about the same at first, but then I was like, I want to see how far this goes. Very cozy. We were cutting it close so we didn't actually snag any refreshments are bad but this is one of those theaters that serves alcohol which i'm still not sure how i feel about that but it can be fun to be the only sober person but i'm you know hit or miss about that but i'm like restaurants can do it why not a movie theater those chairs the screen the sound also here's a tip when you go to a theater bring earplugs lux was digging through his pockets while we were still in the previews because the last preview or interstition or whatever it was called, because it wasn't really a preview. It was them doing some type of class project thing. It hurt my ears. So I was like, oh, yeah, this movie's going to be loud. Dig it through my pocket for my earplugs. I have a curse of being a Boy Scout, ladies and gentlemen. I am always prepared. <laughs> and you're wondering why I'm saying that's a curse? Try wearing a 40 pound vest all day. <laughs> He's exaggerating. It's probably only 20. But yeah, that's basically the general idea. I have a vest. With a lot of stuff in it. I carry around with me all the time because I'm a Boy Scout. So if you need a power adapter, I gotcha. And the screen was really nice. Even though we're like, what, three rows, four rows back? Three rows in. I didn't feel like I was... Staring up at the screen because we bought the tickets in advance. Because we didn't know how popular the movie still was. We didn't want to drive to the theater and then not be able to get tickets. So we're like, oh, why not? And technically assigned seatings. But you can see... They had the whole layout on the website, and you could see, okay, here's the seats, here's the screen, and it was really nice. Yeah, and all you had to do was scan a QR code when you came into the theater, too. Because we checked at the front box office. We're like, um, we bought in advance. Do we check in here? And they went, no, just go straight inside. All we had to do was run our phone under a QR scanner, and they went, okay, this is your movie. These are your seat numbers, and the theater's that way. Speaking of which... That guy seemed to be a little bit confused because he pointed the wrong direction. So we actually went the wrong way, but fortunately, we got ourselves turned around. Also, I didn't see the row letters on the rows, so I was pretty sure of what our row was, and there were already a couple of people sitting. So I went up there, and I said, excuse me, is this this row? And they said, yes. And I'm like, oh, in that case, these are our seats. Yeah, that was awesome. I just want to know where the letters were. Maybe you just have to count A, B, C, D. I don't know. You'd think they'd be there somewhere because they are for concert venues. Maybe they were on the other side. So far, that's, this is like the only downside of this theater so far because the theaters were clearly labeled with pictures and times. Like I said, we didn't get a chance to check out the concessions and see how quickly and how well that was set up. But overall, everything looked really nice, very well laid out, clear. And really easy to get into. Wow. Like, this is the best theater experience I've had. And I've been to some pretty nice theaters. I thought the theater we went to for the MLP movie was really nice. I mean, I was uncomfortable because my feet couldn't touch the ground and the theater was crowded and people were talking. But even in this theater, even though there were people getting up and leaving and coming back and at least three people had their phones on, it wasn't nearly as distracting as that has been in other theaters. So I don't know if that's the theater or the movie. Don't know. Also, did you catch the guy who took a picture while the movie was going on? He did that more than once. Wow. If we were looking at the same people, the people to our left had a lot of flashes going off. I only caught one. Hmm. And this has been our thought on Marvel's Black Panther. Thought? A single thought? Wow, this is a really long thought. It was all interconnected. Oh, yeah, I know we were talking about a Marvel movie, but we don't have super cool after credit scenes, so just have to settle for the um, very blatant sales pitch. So we have more videos. You can watch them. Please like them. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Subscriptions and total view time help this channel a lot. Gets us into more searches, gets us to come up more often as recommended videos, so that more people can discover us. You know, people like you. Welcome, first time viewer. Also, Lux draws a lot. It's all over the internet. The links will have some of it, but I'm sure he's found more places by now. So you can also search Alex Knight and Lux Brush and probably come up with even more. Oh, 
commissions. Yeah, he still does that. Check the link. And if you'd like to support this channel, well, us, channel, us, kind of same thing. Uh, financially, there is both a Patreon and a coffee. All links are below. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.